22nd, so if winter tree planting, that's April 25th, uh, on May 2nd is a green up day. And what's special about this green up day is the city's landfill is going to be open uh, free of charge for city residents uh, who are non-commercial, obviously. We don't want the commercial haulers to, to use it on that day. But if you're, you know, if you live in the city of Burlington uh, and you want to clean out your attic and clean out the basement and get the crap out of the uh, backyard, uh, May 2nd is the day because you can take all of your stuff down to the landfill free of charge. Uh, on that day, we're also going to have volunteers working with the Parks Department and the Public Works Department uh, going throughout the city, getting rid of the litter that's, uh, that in the city, that's in the city. Uh, you know, when the snow melts, you begin to see a lot of things that are not very attractive. Yeah. So we want to clean up the city on that day. Uh, we want to clean up the waterfront area, the park. And uh, we'll be assembling here in City Hall. We'll have uh, the, the uh, implements that will be needed. We'll have plenty of plastic trash uh, bags. Uh, and again, we're going to need volunteers to make that project a success. For those people who might not know where we are, it is not a bird sanctuary. It is the Burlington Landfill. Uh, and this, in fact, is where all of our garbage goes. Last night, actually, today being Saturday, I was watching the Nightline on ABC. And they were talking about the national crisis of how communities get rid of their garbage. And this is a problem that we have been dealing with in Burlington for the last few years. I think that it is fair to say, you know, honest to say, that up until two or three years ago, the Burlington landfill, in fact, was not being run terribly well. Um, but in the last three years, we have, as a result of, of uh, putting pressure on the uh, street department, and then as a result of the reorganization of city government in terms of developing a public works department, we now are running this landfill, we think, perhaps as well as any landfill in the state of Vermont is being run. We're very proud of it. This whole area right here, which is now grassed over, uh, a few years ago used to be uh, not very uh, well kept at all. And the amount of open space where garbage is going in is very limited, and that's obviously over there. Um, within a couple of years at most, the landfill is going to be filled up with capacity. We now we then have a grassy area over here, and I think it's probably fair to say the people uh, 10 years from now will not know that this spot contains thousands of tons of garbage uh, right underneath us. Uh, what we've done today is, as part of the cleanup effort, we have opened up for all non-commercial truckers, uh, all citizens of the city of Burlington, we've opened up the landfill free of charge to encourage people to get the garbage out of their backyards and out of their homes. Um, and also today, actually, interestingly enough, there's a whole new process which has been inaugurated where there is a stand over there by the entrance where people can come in and throw it into a large uh, crate type uh, thing, and that will be transported over here. So not all citizens have got to come over here. So uh, in a nutshell, I think we're making real progress on the Burlington landfill. It's being run well. Uh, it will be closed down within a couple of years, and right now the Public Works Department is in the process of uh, figuring out uh, where we're going to go next, and that opens up a whole interesting debate. But my own feeling is that we'll probably end up at another landfill in another site, and um, that's what's going to happen. What's going to happen out there? Does that stay like that the whole for, forever, or uh? well, what you're looking at over what you're looking at over here, that's a whole other story, and that's, of course, the Burlington Intervale. And the city owns many hundreds of acres, and the Intervale is the last really wide open uh, space in the city of Burlington. And in truth, that's an area where we have not focused enough attention on in recent years, and we're beginning to look at it uh, a lot harder than we used to. My strong feeling is that we want to keep that space uh, open for the future. In fact, the last uh, working farm in the city of Burlington is, of course, down there, owned by Rena Corkins. Uh, I hope very much that that farm will stay in agriculture uh, in years to come and not uh, be used for other types of development. Uh, but at some point, you know, what would be very nice to do is to take a tour of the Intervale. It's an extraordinary resource, and I think many people in the city of Burlington are not even familiar with what we own down there. We have hundreds and hundreds of acres. 
There's an area there that borders right on the Winooski River. Uh, it's a good area for picnicking. It is the wild area in the city of Burlington. Um, and actually, in a few moments, we're going to head down to the McNeil wood chip burning plant where we're giving out free wood chips today for people who need that promotion. Uh, and we can take a, take a little bit of a, of a tour of the area. But uh, for people who may not know it, the city of Burlington owns hundreds and hundreds of acres of open space down in the Intervale. Uh, it's, it's really a great place to go exploring on a Saturday morning. Uh, and it's an area that we're going to have to do some, some real hard thinking about to make certain that it remains open and that it remains wild and it remains uh, available for recreational purposes. But once again, this is, this is the landfill. Uh, it's being run today better than it's ever been run before. Uh, and it will be phased out within a couple of years. And here is a wild animal, looks like a cocker spaniel, coming here to get interviewed as to how he feels about this. Uh... Hey, come here. Want to say hello to the people? No. <laughs> it's kind of shy. What can we do? Okay. All right, we're ready to move. Okay. Okay, this is Tom Moreau, who works with the Public Works Department. And in fact, Tom has the responsibility for making certain that this landfill is being run well. How long have you now been in charge of the landfill company? Since January of 1986, for about a year and a half. Okay. I've been mentioning to the people that in the last couple of years, we've seen some significant transformations as to how this landfill uh, is being run. you want to tell us some of the highlights as to what's happening now? A couple of the major things that we've done in the landfill is two major pollution control measures. As you can see the white line, the poles coming up around the rim of the landfill here, that is a methane collection system. In this building down below, we have installed a vacuum pump. That vacuum draws upon a pipe, which is connected to all the pipes that are in the ground. And therefore, any methane that may be able to escape from the landfill is captured, brought, and burnt, and destroyed as it leaves. OK, so what we're seeing there, you can see actually the vapors are rising. Is that correct? And there's correct. the fire right there. That, that's the fire there. That is the methane that's being generated in the landfill and being destroyed via the uh, via the flame. Okay, Tom. I know that there was a, there was discussion here, and certainly is, there's discussion nationally about the possibility of trapping that methane gas and using it for a productive purpose. We're not using it particularly productively over there. What would the, economically does it turn out not to be viable here? Essentially, we have an RFP out that will be looking at that. What we had to do because of some court action, we wanted to put in certain systems immediately. And our first emphasis was to control the methane migration from the landfill and not to uh, capture it for an economic uh, right. recovery. That right. will come, and I think this landfill has suitability for you that. You do think so, economically? Yeah. Oh, yes. in, in, the sh in the short term. It all depends on how much garbage right. you have, how long right. it's been there. The second major pollution control measure that we have in the, in the landfill is along the uh, northern slope and the western slope, we've dug a 10-foot trench lined with rock and with pipe and all the leachate that's generated from the landfill is captured in this and a pump station down below pumps it up to the sewer on Manhattan Drive where it's treated at one of our treatment plants. So essentially now the leachate is not leaking into the uh, down below into the uh, yes into the into the uh, uh, water, uh, into the water table the groundwater right. table. Uh, it's predicted that 85 to 95 percent of the leachate generated at this landfill is generated uh, from percolation or rain or snow melt and we're capturing that and sending it to one of our treatment plants for treatment. That, those are the two major control measures that we have done at the landfill. And the other, other uh, things we've done is mainly cleanup. Uh, you can see the whole bank along Manhattan Drive has been bulldozed, seeded. There used to be car bodies, refrigerators, boats. Uh, this whole road here is reasonably yes, this, new, this, isn't it? This, this road is new. We're trying to get good access up into the landfill for all the different people. And so we've also done a lot of aesthetic work. We've put in litter fences. If you see the green fences yeah. around, they're all just trying to catch papers on blowing days. The landfill is rising in elevation. Therefore, we're more susceptible to the right. winds and also more aesthetically uh, uh, to people. They can see it more because it's no longer in a hole. It's getting higher and higher. And we try to build the lifts. And what we've just done here is a lot of people are we're coming into the landfill with their personal cars. And on muddy days, this gets difficult in the landfill. So what we've done is we've made a ramp and put a trash uh, packer in here. And periodically during the day and during the week, uh, a hauler will come in, pick this up, bring it into our landfill, and it keeps a lot of the personal cars sure. out of the landfill. So essentially now for the, for the, sm for the smaller vehicles, for the regular cars, they don't have to go tramping through the mud 
That's and throw the stuff in, you could just dump it right into that right. thing. I have a good hard road that will be able to come up, just dump it right into the dumpster, and then from there. Okay. So, what do you think? Is there another couple of years left in this? About. Two more years. Okay. Well, I congratulate you and the department for making the very significant improvements that have been needed. So not only is it aesthetically a lot more attractive, and a lot less garbage is, is flying out, but we have now captured the methane gas. Now the real trick is to see whether that can be used productively. We can get some revenue back from that. That is correct, and in, in, uh, the city and the, the department is looking at that. Does so that flame go 24 hours a day? 365 days a year. It's our eternal flame <laughs> to garbage. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> May I ask, how do you burn it without going out of control? Um, the vacuum pump that sucks the methane out of the ground is set at a certain rate. And so it only brings so much gas to the surface at any particular time. And so that's controlled. We have valves on the whole system. Each well, if you can just see the little black box between yeah. in front of it, is a, is a valve. And so our technicians go in and adjust the valve just enough where we're uh, removing just enough methane and we can burn it under control. Is there much of a fluctuation in, in Yes, there is. Really? Real, is? There's, a, there's a major fluctuation depending on the uh, frost cover on the landfill. So if the land in, right. Like most earth, it breathes, but when the earth can't breathe, especially during the winter months, or as we've compacted the landfill better and put better cover material on, it forces more methane into the gas. But on a day-to-day -day -day basis, everything being equal, there should not be. Should yeah, actually no, there is. It depends on moisture. Sometimes oh, also. Oh, yeah. It's what, what, I was, what I was thinking, methane gas is a type of gas that almost is like gasoline. Turn around, can it explode if it ain't controlled? Yep. Yes, it can. It's, methane is an explosive, but not underground because it won't get those kind of concentrations. But that's how come, you know, the, the whole site is locked up and everything's totally controlled. Listen, Jane, you should intro, intro, introduce yourself to the viewers. This is Jane McDougall. I know him from St. Joseph's. <laughs> and Jane has been working with the this city and helping us out in the volunteer capacity. And as well as city. Let me, let me finish, all right? in the last few years in helping us making the city aware of the Handic problems of the handicap. That's right. Handicapped accessibility on the sidewalk and as far as getting the rip, the old broken up to get brand new and making it into more so accessible to turn around and to get better of a painted crosswalk so anybody, not just the handicapped, anybody can see where they go because they're partly fading away and they need to be repainted every so often so many times a year because of the rainwaters and the snow and the salt deteriorate the paint. Absolutely right. And that's, and but that's another division of public works that we have to talk to. That's not Tom's problem. Well, no, I didn't say it was Tom. I'm just saying just boiling down to that as far as maintaining the city streets, crosswalks, and sidewalks, and refixing the broken. That's right. <laughs> Special surprise. And it also has to be cycling. Thank you. Okay, today uh, at the landfill, uh, the Public Works Department has been giving out some literature explaining why, in fact, fees have gone up quite significantly, and they have. Now, we knew that a couple of years ago, uh, because of mandates placed on us by the state government, uh, and because of our own inclination, we wanted to phase out this landfill and make it as environmentally sound as we could. And that's an expensive proposition. We placed on two occasions bond issues before the people. In both instances, we got an overwhelming majority, but we didn't get the two-thirds that we needed. In one instance, we lost by a few tenths of a percentage point, if I recall, okay. right? So in order to come up with the money to phase out this landfill in an environmentally sound way and to deal with the methane problem that Tom was talking about and the leachate problem, and other problems, it costs us money. And what the Public Works Department has been giving out today is some literature explaining to the people where the money is going uh, uh, through their increased tipping fee. Tom, do you want to maybe go over this uh, diagram a little bit? Fine. What you'll see is the greatest percentage of the fees will go to capital projects. That's to pay back the uh, pollution control measures. Roughly 39 to 40 percent of our fees are going to put, uh, pay for the leachate control system and the methane control system. 
The other major block you'll see here is the fill and cover material, which is roughly 26% of our cost. Unlike a lot of the area landfills, Burlington has to import all its cover material. We go out to bid yearly, award the bid, and then it's trucked in on a daily basis. And then you'll see down here a very large 10% uh, of our fees is now going to investigate new alternatives. We're looking at all... Uh, the city is investigating various alternatives for the future, the long-term solution of our uh, solid waste uh, problem. And then the remaining, approximately 25% of our cost is just going into actually running the landfill. The salaries, the utilities, and the maintenance. But notice also that roughly 5.6% of our total budget is going into a recycling effort. And our, the hope is, is that if the city of Burlington can significantly reduce the volume of trash that has to go to the landfill, it will significantly also reduce the uh, cost of operating okay. the landfill. I mean, the first, the first point that I want to reemphasize is that if you run, there was a time in this state's history and all over the country, people would have a big hole, you throw your crap into it, it was very cheap. The result of that is that you have polluted uh, water, uh, the possibility of toxic waste getting into people's drinking waters and so forth. So in the last number of years, there has been obviously a significant increase in the consciousness of the people about the environment and about landfills, excuse me, Jane, and about the impact of landfills. And uh, what Tom is telling us is, is, I think what everybody understands, is that it is a very, very expensive process. Right. This landfill today is being run in a more, much more environmentally sound way than it has ever been run before. However, uh, as a result of that, we are spending a significant, significantly more money than we ever have before. Now, we are thinking, as we leave Burlington to go to another landfill, having a, a, an engineered landfill and a state-of-the-art landfill, and that is going to be a very expensive proposition because we're going to build in, in the beginning, all of these things that we have just put in here in the last few years, make sure that the leachate is collected. Make sure that the methane gas is collected and used effectively. And that's not cheap. That's correct. Uh, the state-of-the-art landfills now, uh, Burlington on an average is paying $22.40 per ton. To give you a range in New England, that's on the very low end of the scale. Philadelphia, just, just per comparison for some large cities, Philadelphia is paying around $100 to $120 per ton to get rid of their trash. A lot of the New England landfills are into the $20 to $60 range per ton. Okay. Now, one of the piece of things here, which this piece of literature mentions, which is important and, and mentions for the people what we are trying to do, is uh, increase our ability to recycle uh, material. And uh, recently, uh, the city has appropriated some money to that effort, and a young lady named uh, Veronique Kalia has been hired to help coordinate our activities. How are we doing uh, in that area now? Essentially, what we're uh, the first step in the recycling effort will be to determine markets, what can be readily uh, recyclable, what are people's attitudes towards recycling, and establish a program in which we can effectively target certain areas, whether it be newsprint, right. computer paper, office paper, uh, cardboard, glass and bottles, cans, and essentially we're just uh, doing the upfront work of trying to locate markets, look at other successful programs across the country, determine cost, and then when we implement our program and go to the, to the citizenry, we will have a, a, a program in place that will tell us, yes, it is effective for us to do it, and this is how much waste reduction we'll now, see. Recycling is more complicated than it looks on the surface. Because is, the fact of the matter is, unfortunately, especially, I guess, in New England, it is not quite so easy to sell the, the material and, and uh, even break even. It's a losing proposition, as I understand that. In fact, if, if one was to recycle newspapers effectively, what the, the data that I have seen in recent literature is that the, most of the people would have to work for sub-minimum wage in order to be cost-effective to recycle the newspaper. That's, but there's a difference between price and cost there. Right, I, exactly. That's the point that I want to get at. Now, to what degree does that equation uh, reflect the fact that, that tons of stuff will not be coming into the landfill and that saves us money. Well, if you can, if you can look at it like it's costing Burlington $22.40 per ton to, to run a landfill, if you cut down that tonnage, not only will you get dollars for the newsprint or whatever that you're trying to recycle, that you also have to factor in the cost of what would have it cost Precisely. to put it into a landfill. Right. And keeping and the landfill open for that much for longer. For that much so longer, far. yes. And I, those are the kind of equations that we're working on now, setting up the entire program to see if we can get an effective program for the city of Burlington. And also what's, what's interesting is that markets 
uh, to some degree uh, dependent upon the location you are in the country. For example, out on the west coast, they're able to ship various uh, recycled products to uh, Asia. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, one of the things that you're going to see is it might be you. It might be nice for Burlington to want to come in and recycle all its bottles and cans and recycle all its newsprint, but Burlington alone in the New England market is just not sufficient. Right. And so therefore Burlington may have to bring some of its recycled material as far as way as Delaware or Washington DC or Baltimore area, and that really makes it cost prohibitive to try to recycle. Now do I understand correctly that on the west coast, what, they send glass to uh, they, Japan? Is yes, it there? yes. They send uh, the west coast, is, uh, because they have some more concentrated markets, uh, has been able to significantly have greater recycling than we have, mainly because of some of the Asian markets. Okay, this is George Tabo, who is my assistant, the assistant to the mayor. And George has been very active in the whole beautification effort. And we should point out that what we're doing today is part of an overall beautification project, uh, which was very generously aided by the Howard Bank. They have their sign over there and the Howard Bank contributed $18,000 to making this beautification project a success. Last week, uh, we had approximately uh, 150 or 200 volunteers out planting trees throughout the city. Uh, and this, this week, of course, is the cleanup effort. And as part of the cleanup effort, we are also dispensing uh, free of charge uh, wood chips. And we're here at the McNeil Wood Chip Burning Plant. George, what's, what's that idea about? Uh, we have a 100-ton pile behind us, Bernie. We have to get rid of by a little later today. I think uh, this is going to be used a lot of uh, flower gardens, hedges around the city, trees. People are going to be mulching uh, some of the trees that we planted and, uh, and also trees from a couple of years ago that are, that are still doing very well. Uh, it's a kind of a bark mulch. The Department of uh, Electric Department has kind of put it over here near the gate for us and uh, people have been attacking it since 8 o'clock <laughs> this morning. Okay. And uh, this stuff, what, becomes very good fertilizer, is that correct? Well, it'll break down over time and, and, and feed the soil, but it's basically used to, uh, you know, cover the ground and uh, keep the moisture in and block out weeds, and it uh, looks attractive, too, in a lot yeah, of places. It does look very places. attractive. Okay, this, this pile was 100? 100 tons. Good. And uh, we're uh, trying to get that down to zero. Uh, we started with a 25-ton pile, and I thought that, we'd, that we would need more, we, so we, the department uh, brought out some of their big equipment and put some more of this over here. So this is the kind of a wood chip they, they usually do not burn this. They, uh, this is kind of a, a discard. It's more of a shredded material, bark mulch. It's, it's actually much better for, for mulching what people are going to be using it for than the real wood chips. Good. Good. Okay, we have some hard-working people up there. It's this young man over here. <laughs> Glad, glad to see you doing some productive work. We have two people who occasionally pose as the economic development director and the treasurer. Yeah. Well, this is a lot easier. This is a lot easier than pushing papers. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. Absolutely. All right. Good. Okay. Good enough. Now, behind us, you can see a number of cows and an old farm and some people working on the farm. So the question is, are we in Franklin County? Are we in East Montpelier? Are we in Southern Vermont? Where are we? Well, the answer, of course, is we are in the city of Burlington, and this is the last uh, active farm in our city, and it's owned by Rena Corkins. And in fact, you can see a little bit of the old and a little bit of the new, because right across the street is the McNeil wood chip burning plant. And I think sometime within the next couple of, of months, or maybe even sooner than that, we're going to come down uh, and do a little bit more talking about the intervale in general and about Rena's farm, but uh, did just want to mention to the people as we pass by this area that there is one active farm remaining in the city of Burlington, and that's Rena's farm, and, and that's where we are right now.